And as you're turning there, I want you to think about something this morning. Um, ask yourself, and, and maybe write it down. Uh, maybe you can exchange this with, with each other later, but, but I want you to think about this as we, uh, as we go through the, the passages this morning. Why are you here? Why are you here at this conference? Why do you meet together? Some of you, uh, I know there's just a handful of you in a certain location, and you're the only people that you know where you are in your location, at your home, that believes this. Just, oh, okay, it's falling off. Okay. Someone asked me, do you get nervous? And this is where it is when you're all looking at me and I'm fidgeting with my mic. But, but anyhow, there's, there's a bunch of you here that, that you, you meet in, in, in certain areas and, and there's just maybe a handful of you, maybe a dozen, give or take. And you're the only people that believe this message. You're the only people that you know in that area uh, that believe God's word rightly divided, that you, you understand the revelation of the mystery. And there seems that everyone else who, who knows you and talks to you about these things, or when you try to talk to them, they look at you and they think you're odd. Um, there, was some, there were some saints that I was visiting last year, and I said, you have to understand, you guys in, in your community, in your area, you're the, you're the weirdos. You're nuts. And they came from a... Uh, big, you know, big Baptist church and, and so on, and that's where they left, and people knew them. And they were the oddballs that believed this, this stuff. And I want you to ask yourself this morning, why, do you, why are you here at this conference this morning uh, to, to, to learn about the things uh, that we learn about? To, to, why, do you, why do you appreciate God's Word, especially rightly divided? And I want you to, if you want, you don't have to, but write that answer down. Why am I here? And that, that'll play a factor uh, as we, as we uh, continue. But some of you might be here because you're looking for a spouse. <laughs> Don't put that down. Don't write that down. But if I had to take a couple of guesses, I probably could figure out why you're here. And we'll, we'll address that later. But 1 Timothy chapter 6 here, we'll start in verse 1. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1. Let as many servants as... What did I say? Did I say 1 Timothy? Okay, we're good. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the, uh, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine, which is according to godliness. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall in temptation, and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art. Thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, unto the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, again, we thank you this morning to, have, to, to come together to open up your word and to, to just enjoy what we, what we learn here. To, to rejoice in, in who you are and all that you provided for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we can't thank you enough for that. We thank you for your wonderful love and your, and your grace that you demonstrated at Calvary and that you demonstrate to us every day uh, in, in Christ. And, and we thank you for your faithfulness. If it were up to mine, that doesn't please you. But it's Christ's faithfulness and it's your faithfulness. And Lord, we can rejoice in that and we can live in that. And we thank you for that. Amen. Here in First Timothy... Uh, especially here in chapter 6, Paul is giving Timothy a, a, a certain charge to flee, to follow, to fight the good fight of faith, and to be faithful in his ministry, to be faithful in those things. I'm going to talk to you this morning about following after. And there's, there's those six things that he mentions there, and we're going we're to dissect that 
uh, as we progress. But this charge that Paul gives Timothy is given in light of men departing from the faith and, and following after error. And they're teaching things they shouldn't be teaching. And the theme of this conference is what? It's declaring the faith, it's declaring the gospel, and defending the faith. And that's what you find in the books of First and Second Timothy. And that's what we're going to find here in, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Now, First and, and Second Timothy focus very heavily on the issue of doctrine. And we're going to spend some time looking at that as well. But it focuses very much on, on doctrine. Doctrine is the information, the teaching, the instruction that we find in God's Word that teaches us about who God is, what He's doing, and where we fit in with what God's doing. Of course, as, as we read about in Genesis 3 and all the way out in, you know, in the future and, and today, Satan, when, when, when God's there and it's his doctrine, Satan's there to corrupt it and to counterfeit it every single time. And when we preach God's word and we preach it rightly divided, you will find opposition and you will find adversity knocking on your door. And I've learned that the more you preach and the more you open your mouth and the more you talk about this, you're a lightning rod. You, you, you find all kinds of trouble that you didn't expect to find. And you find all kinds of opposition. And uh, there's a reason for that. That's not just some accident. That's not just because some people are, you know, they, they disagree and, and, they, and they get upset about it for a reason. And Satan uses that to, to discourage us and to, and to knock us off um, our game. So in Timothy, we are therefore warned about the opposition that we're going to face, and, we're, and we are warned about the adversity that we will find when we preach God's Word. Now, God's truth, the Word of God, will provoke men to reveal what's in their heart. It will provoke men to reveal what they really, truly value, and I want you to keep that in mind. That if you want to know what someone really cares about, I asked you earlier, why are you here? Now that you could say it in so many words, but I bet you it boils down to one thing, is because you value what you learn. You value the truth. And if you do write, I, want, I do want you to write that answer down if you're willing. Truth will provoke men to reveal what they value. Here in 1 Timothy 6, we learn about what I'll refer to as the foolish man. He's proud, knowing nothing, and so on and so forth. The foolish man finds gain and worth and value in what? In himself and his own righteousness, and the pleasures of the world, as he says there in 2 Timothy. And, and that's what the, the, this foolish man values, and this is what he lives in, and this is what he uh, appreciates. Yet the man of God is to value what? The doctrine and the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's to follow after some things. He's to run away from all, all kinds of sins and unrighteousness, and he's to follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Quite a contrast. Where to find the value in the doctrine and the life of the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, I want you to notice, let's, let's dissect this passage now. Here in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11, Paul refers to Timothy, he, he writes to him, But thou, O man of God. What a special title that is. Man of God. You are God's man or woman. You, you, are, you are his. You are his servant. You are his ambassador. You're his steward. You're the man of God. There's, there's another time that this phrase is used. Come with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. A verse I have no doubt you're all familiar with. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after. You are God's man. That's an identity issue. You're not someone who who goes to church once a week and, yeah, Christ, you know, he, I appreciate that and he's kind of next to my life. No, he is our life. You have to remember that. He is our life. And, and, and he's our identity. We're found in him. There's that verse there in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, uh, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. He's our everything. Christ is our everything. He's our whole life. He's not a part of our life. He's everything to us. He is my life. And, uh, and the man of God is to, is to recognize that and to know that. Notice here 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. 
All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. There is some profit in Scripture, and here's how we, here's how we find it. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the what? Hello. That the man of God may be what? Perfect. Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. When, when Paul t- uh, uh, identifies Timothy as a man of God, he is talking about a believer who is equipped, who is mature, who is, who is operating with the, with the right understanding of the doctrine. He understands his identity and he understands what he needs to function to serve the Lord. And that is, he needs to know his authority. All scripture is given by inspiration. He has God's word. He is God's spokesman. And so are you. So am I. Amen? Amen. Amen. What a wonderful privilege that is. We are the Lord's man, and we, we are equipped. He equips us with his word to, to, uh, to grow, to mature, and to be able to, to see men saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So this man of God, when he's talking to, to, to Timothy, and he refers to him as man of God, he's talking about a believer here who is equipped and who is, who is learning the doctrine and, and is coming to a point of, of perfection, maturity, growth. Now, a lot of times people will see that man of God and say, well, that's the, that's the preacher. The preacher has to be concerned with fleeing and following and that sort of thing, and I hope he does it. I'll pray for him. But that's you and that's me too. We claim 2 Timothy 3.17, that the man of God may be perfect. That's the desired result, right? That's where we want to be. That's how we want to function. The same as goes for 1 Timothy chapter 6. Who here doesn't want to follow righteousness and godliness and so on and so forth? This is not just something for the preacher or the, you know, the pastor in the church. This is, this is for all of us here, all the believers here. This is a personal issue. Now, I want, I want to bring up one other point about this. Paul is warning Timothy about all these activities and all these things going on here, that there are men departing from the faith, that there are men who are following and pursuing after error. And he says, Thou, man of God, flee these things Timothy is not immune to those troubles, and neither are you, and neither am I. And we're going to see how important that is to have the right uh, perspective on things, that I, I am susceptible to the opposition that we face. And time and time again, I have talked to a handful of people already this week that have given accounts and, and have talked about you know, just the people that we know. Hey, how so, is so-and-so doing, and what do you hear? It seems almost every year, every, every time you, you find someone, you talk to someone, there's, a, there's some account of someone leaving the faith. There's someone departing from the truth. Or someone getting caught up with the pleasures of the world. And you say, wow, that's surprising. And we shouldn't be surprised. Now, I'm not saying, you know, <laughs> take bets as to who's the next person that's going to, you know, <laughs> fall. You know, don't do that. <laughs> that would be stupid. But... And I've thought about that, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> you know, who's it, who's, I, I, I'm not, is it going to be Des? Is it going to be Ken? Is it going to be Ted? Probably Ted. <laughs> he has some shortcomings. But... Ho! Oh! <laughs> Don't do that. But we're not immune to the trouble that we face. And we have to have the right perspective and the right understanding to protect ourselves from that. And God has equipped us to do so. So I want you to keep that in mind about the man of God. That one, he is God's man. That's an identity issue. He is to be equipped and mature and grow. See, the reason he brings that up is that these characteristics here, flee, follow, fight, and be faithful for and faithful to, these are characteristics of a mature believer. And we're to follow after that. We're to pursue that. I'll get into that in a minute, but... But keep in mind, he's t- Timothy was an apostle, an evangelist, a teacher, an elder. Paul, Paul says, this can happen to you as well. He says in chapter 4, verse 16, Take heed unto thyself and to the doctrine, and in so doing thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. See, Paul was not immune to any of this, and neither are we. Now this issue of, of following after, verse 11, And follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. Some things that we, we need to understand about this following here. Um, turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. There's a phrase here that, that really helps put this in perspective. This kind of following there in 1 Timothy 
chapter 6 is not, it's not just some intellectual type of following. I follow this writing, or I follow you know, the Cubs losing streak, or I follow whatever it is. It's not some sort of, you know, I follow the works of, of you name it. It's not that kind of a following. It's not necessarily the following of just some consequential things. You know, you, you, uh, you reap what you sow. Um, there are elements of that in there, but, but this following is a little different. I want to cover a few aspects of it here. First, uh, First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 15. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 15. See that none render evil for evil unto any man. But notice this, this next phrase here. But ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Ever follow. Never stop. Let me ask you a question. Is there a time ever that you're to stop following after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness? Absolutely not. You'll probably be pursuing that all, all the way out in eternity. You'll never stop following after that. We're never supposed to stop. So the word itself, follow after, implies that it's an ongoing, constant, perpetual, continual following. Now, that puts kind of a different perspective on things. This isn't some walk in the park. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. This is not just some sort of casual, intellectual... I mean, there is an intellectual part of it, don't get me wrong. But there's more, more to it than that. I, want to get, I, want, I just want you to see the, the heart of, of, of this issue here, following... And what, what Paul is describing here. This is a, well, you'll notice in here in Philippians 3, this is a very zealous, heated, focused pursuit of some things. Notice here, Philippians chapter 3, Paul uses the same terminology here about following after. Start in verse 12. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. Oh, actually, start in verse 8. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. That's verse 8. Uh, of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Aren't you glad you have that? Aren't you glad you have Christ's righteousness? If you didn't have his, you'd be in a lot of trouble. And we're going to see those men there in, in Ephesus and those people that Timothy was dealing with they abandoned that truth, and they wanted to teach something else. And we'll see how that happens, but, but notice there, uh, verse, where do we leave off? Verse 8, the end of verse 8 there, that I may win Christ and be found in him. I read that verse, didn't I? Well, let's read it again, it's good. And I am be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. It's his faithfulness, it's his doing. It's the faith of Christ. the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings be made, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. You see what's going on here? Paul is saying, I have, I have his righteousness. And, I'm, and that's what I'm trying to, as you'll see here, trying to pursue. That's what I'm trying to get a hold of. He says, I want to know him. Not just know about him, I want to know him. I want to know who he is. The power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. It's not that he doesn't, he's not going to experience the resurrection of the dead, but he wants to experience and get, and get a hold of that life. Verse 12, not as though I had already attained. See, Paul's attitude about this was not that I already have it, I've already made it. You know, we can, we can fall susceptible to that kind of thinking. I've arrived. And the answer is No. That's the wrong mentality to have because once you have that, then you quit. And you, don't, you no longer pursue the truth. And you no longer pursue those things that we read there in, in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Notice there, he says, Not as though as I already, had already attained, verse 12, Neither were already perfect, but I follow after. Notice the next term there. If that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Why did Christ save me? Why did he justify me? Why did he give me his life? So that I can serve him and that I could, I, could have, I could be in fellowship with him and that I could function with him in what he's doing today. See, the doctrine teaches that. And I want that very thing, that they which should live, 2 Corinthians 5.15, that they which should live should henceforth not live unto themselves but unto him which died and rose again. 
I'm not here to live for myself. Why? Because I'm crucified. That old man, that, that, that dirty, rotten, uh, old nature is dead. And I have his life. I'm God's man. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, verse 13. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Notice he says, I follow after that I may apprehend. I want to get a hold of something. And I keep following and I keep pursuing and I keep chasing. And I want to get a hold of something. And I never count myself as to have already had it, already got my hands on it. I keep going. What does he say there in verse 13? Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth under those things which are before. I'm not looking over here, I'm not looking over here, and I'm not looking back yonder. I'm, I'm pressing forward, I'm looking forward. There's something that I have my mind on, that I'm focused on. Notice there, I press toward the mark. He says, I'm following after. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And that's to know Him. See, this following after... And the same is, is true in 1 first, in first Timothy chapter 6. Turn back there. 1 Timothy chapter 6. That following after is a, is a zealous, heated, hot pursuit. It is a focused pursuit of righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness, those six things. And we're going to see why Paul brings those six things up. But, but, but Paul says, he says, flee these things. So you're running away from something to run to something else. I'm running away from this unrighteousness and this, and this bad thinking and this bad doctrine and this bad teaching. Why? So I can run over here and follow after something else, something better than that. First Timothy chapter 6. So when you read that, that term there, follow after, it is an ongoing, constant, continual, heated, focused pursuit of one thing. And we're going to see what that one thing is. Now, it's manifesting a lot of other things here. i got to work out, man. I'm, get going. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying. I, yeah, my core in shape. I'm feeling that string tugging me. First Timothy chapter 6. So when we look at these things, and we're going to, we're going to start looking into what, what the righteousness and the godliness. Why does Paul bring that up? I don't need to define a lot of these things for you. You already know. And, and we'll, we'll cover some of that. But I want to I address, do you ever wonder, why, why does Paul bring up those six things? Why doesn't he say, follow after truth and grace and whatever else? Why does he bring up those specific things? And we'll see why here in a minute. But that following after, don't forget that. That it is an ongoing, continual pursuit. Ever see that TV show, Cops? Okay, like two people. Uh, three, okay, okay, now you, okay, you, you feel better now that other people raise their hands. You ever see, okay, that TV show Cops, it was one of my, my dad's favorite shows. And um, I remember being little, and he said, okay, we're going to watch real reality TV. Don't give me the American Idol, don't give me the Survivor, I want to watch you know, real reality. Real reality. And that's something. And so, what happens on the TV show Cops? They don't have that in the Netherlands? In Switzerland? Cops? Okay. I'll explain how it works. They knock on someone's door. Hey, I heard you're growing something interesting in your backyard. We're here to check this out. We got some complaints next door. Cop shows up and there's someone, you know, following him with the camera. And then once the guy realizes he's busted, he, he takes off running. The cop starts running after him. This police, the police officer, police officer, he doesn't, they don't like being co called cops, I've, I've realized. So this policeman, he's chasing after that, that, that crook, that, the criminal. And we can call him other things too, but this is supposed to be spiritual. So he follows after this, 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 this criminal and he's, and he's chasing, the police officer's chasing him and he's in a heated pursuit. And he doesn't think of anything else. He doesn't stop at the 7-Eleven and say, you know what, this is a good pursuit. This is good, I'm going to get a Slurpee. No, he doesn't do that. He has, and, and, and see that picture, when you think of following after, think of someone who's focused on one thing only, and that's to apprehend that person. And we're here to apprehend Christ. I don't want to, you know, go crazy with that, but I want you to get that in your mind because it's very, very important. 
And it'll help us later on. That probably didn't help at all, but anyway. Let's look at some of these things. Why does Paul bring up these six particular things? Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness, and so on. Um, come with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1. i got 29 minutes. So we've got to get moving here. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, and we'll start in verse 3. Paul brings up righteousness. Now, what you'll see in all six of those things is that they will be contrasted with the men that are departing from the faith that are following after error. And we'll see that throughout all of 1st and 2nd Timothy. When Paul gives that charge to Timothy, he is anticipating some trouble coming later on, and that's what we find out in 2nd Timothy. Okay? Here in 1st Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. And by the way, Paul knew the trouble that was coming, Acts chapter 20. He says, even of your own selves, he calls the elders of Ephesus together. And he says, even of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things of corrupt minds. They're drawing disciples after them. Can you imagine getting all of us together in a room and Paul, you know, here's Paul the Apostle saying, some of you guys are going to do this. And he, what does he tell them? He says, take heed unto yourselves. That's what he tells Timothy. And see, what happened was, here, and this is the, this is the backdrop and the context in which Timothy has his ministry. Where the same, the same men here... The, these elders in, in Ephesus, notice in verse 3, But as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith. So do. Now the end of the commandment is charity, out of a pure heart and of a good conscience, and of faith unfeigned, from which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling. Bunch of empty noise. Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. But for who? The lawless. And so you had men here. The implication is that, he tells Timothy, teach, charge the others that they teach no other doctrine. What's the implication there? That there were men teaching other doctrines, that they were teaching things they shouldn't have been teaching, that they were departing from the faith, that they were falling into error, and that Timothy was to do what? Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering. He was to do all those things. Why? Because there were some teaching things that they shouldn't. Now, here's what's amazing is that they know better. They knew better. They knew the doctrine. They knew the truth. Paul taught them personally. He said, I, I declared all, unto you all the counsel of God, Acts chapter 20. Check it out. Read Acts chapter 20, starting, I think, in verse 25 or so, and see all the parallels that run in with First and Second Timothy. Wonderful study. He said, for three years, night and day, I warned you with tears. These men knew the truth. They knew the doctrine. They learned from Paul himself. Now, if that's the case, you and I are not immune to, to falling into that. We have to know that. Notice there, they're desiring to be teachers of the law, verse 7 understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. The law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless. What were those men doing there? They were teaching righteousness through the law. That if you keep the law and that if you perform and if you do this, that's how you, how, that's how you produce righteousness. Come with me to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. We all know here that the, the Galatians had a a very obvious problem, and that was they were legalists. Paul says to them in, in Galatians chapter 3, Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect in the, by the flesh? You started one way. You were, you, you, were, you were justified by faith. You understood the grace of God. You, you, you trusted that by faith and faith alone and faith only. And now you're going to live a life to please God without faith or, or, or by, uh, alongside works and, and righteousness? Notice what he tells them here in Galatians 4, verse 19, but man of God, I travail in birth. No, he doesn't say that, does he? What does he say? My little children. You guys are acting like a bunch of little punks. <laughs> Knock it off. My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be what? Formed in you. See, the man of God is to have Christ formed in him. 
That's maturity. But here they were acting like little children. And it was a bunch of do's and don'ts and rules. And if you, you know, he says earlier there in Galatians chapter 4. Now I say, verse 1, that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. That's the law. The law is a schoolmaster. The law tells you how to behave and how to act. And here's what you do and here's what you don't do. And they were, they were trusting in that to produce righteousness, to please the Lord. And he says, why do you frustrate the grace of God? If righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And Christ isn't dead in vain. Amen. But those men there in Ephesus, come, come back to 1 Timothy chapter 1. What they were doing was, it was the very thing that the, the Galatians were doing. That they were, they were teaching that if you, if you wanted to please God, if you wanted to have righteousness, you find it in the law. Actually... I'm sorry, you, you turned away from there, but Galatians 4, uh, 21, he says something very similar to what we read in 1 Timothy 1. He says, they are desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding not... Uh, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not getting it right. Here we go. Understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. They don't know what they're talking about. They don't know what they're, what they're, uh, what they're teaching. They don't understand. Galatians chapter 4, verse 21 says, Paul writes to them, Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? What did we learn about the law back in Romans chapter 3? Romans chapter 2. That is, it's the knowledge of sin. What did we learn in Romans chapter 7? That the law is, it's good, it's just, it's holy, right? What's the problem? You and I aren't. We're not. We are not good. We're not just holy in and of ourselves. Paul writes to Philemon in verse 7, he says, To the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. If you want to find something that's good, if you want to find something that's right, you find it in Christ. You don't find it in trying to please God by your goodness and by, and by your activity. He says there in, in Romans chapter 7, For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Why? He says before, that in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. I know that in me, dwell, in, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. In and of myself, I'm just rotten. Oh, wretched man. Contrast that verse, I think it's Romans 7, 18. You can turn there real quick. Because this, this, is, this is what these men were teaching here. That if you, wanted to, if you wanted to have righteousness and produce righteousness, it came by the law, it came by doing, it came by... Now, they're teaching doctrine, but they're teaching the wrong doctrine. Romans chapter 7, verse 18. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, for the will is present with me. There's the willpower, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. I've got the desire, I have the good intentions, I have the, the, the sincere earnest to do what's right, but I can't. I don't have the ability. And, and, and right down next to that verse, Philippians 2, verse 13. For it is God which worketh in you both to what? To will and to do. He will give you the will and he will give you the ability to do it. You don't please God by keeping the law, by doing, by trying to please him. I tell people all the time that there are good people in the world. Lost men could be good men, good moral uh, people with sincere desires, sincere intentions. But what's the problem? That's not faith. Sincerity, goodness, good intentions, good people. That's not believing God's word. He says in Luke chapter 18, verse 9, Christ spoke a parable unto certain which trusted in themselves and in their own righteousness and despised others. And what's that parable? He talks about the Pharisee goes down to pray, and he says, Lord, I thank you that I'm not as other men are. Now notice in that verse there, in verse I think at least 9 or 10, this is always interesting to me, and you'll relate. He says, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and that publican. That IRS agent, he's the worst. He went from extortioners, he went from unjust, it's getting pretty bad, adulterers, you can die, Leviticus 20, verse 10, and then that tax collector. And he said, I'm not like him. I tithe, and I do this, and I do that. Thank, thank you, Lord, that I'm not like him. And what, is that, what does that publican say? He says, Lord, be merciful unto me, a sinner. And that man went home justified. That's an important verse to write down. Luke 18, 9, they trusted in themselves. When you teach the law, you know, what you're, you know what you're teaching? To trust in yourself. 
You're teaching, you're putting people under a curse. You're cursing people. Do you realize that? I'm not saying you guys, you know, but, but in general, people, when they teach the law, he says, cursed is every man that... that um, Galatians 3. Galatians chapter 3, before I mess that one up too. There we go. Verse 10. Galatians 3.10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. And when you teach the law, you're putting people under a curse. And you're saying, I want to curse you. Now, people don't realize that, but that's what they're doing. There's no life in that. There's no pleasing God. But Philippians 2.13 is a wonderful verse. It says, God, he's the one who's going to work in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. You want to please God? Where does God find pleasure? Where, do, where is God pleased? In the Son. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. It was like Richard talked about on Sunday. That we're accepted in the beloved. And when we, when we identify ourselves with Christ, because that's reality, when we identify ourselves with his life, that's when God's pleased. God will never be pleased with, with Charlie in and of himself, but he's pleased with me when he's pleased with me because I'm in Christ one, but also when I walk and I live by faith in this book. This is this is the Lord Jesus Christ written down. I didn't plan on taking all that time on, on that issue, but we'll keep going. If you're hungry, think about that verse that talks about praying and fasting. 2 Timothy, chapter 3. Now see, Paul's telling, they're desiring to be teachers of the law. They're teaching righteousness by, by the law. And if you want to please God, you have to do and you have to perform. And they're teaching kind of doctrine. They're teaching Israel's sanctification. They're not teaching yours. 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 16. What did Timothy have? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. You find instruction in righteousness from the Word of God. But what does chapter 2, verse 15 tell you? You guys know the verse. You know what to do. You have to study understanding what's what and where's what, and you have to rightly divide. You have to understand what God's will is for today. Do you know what wisdom is? It's being able to, it's being able to, to take the understanding of God's will and being able to use that in every, in every circumstance that comes your way in life. That's wisdom. Man's wisdom is taking God's will, and it's, it's, it's man's way of doing God's work, in essence. And, see, Timothy had instruction in righteousness. And he understood the hidden wisdom, and he understood what God was doing today. But, more than that, he wasn't taking the teaching of the law and putting people under a curse and, and hexing them and so on and so forth. He wasn't doing that. But rather, he had instruction in righteousness. And you find righteousness in the Lord Jesus Christ. Come with me to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. Now, when he says follow after righteousness, keep in mind, you possess the righteousness of God. You have that. You're justified. You're declared righteous. That's not something that if you don't pursue that, then you'll lose that righteousness or something of that sort. That's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is the... the the practice that comes from the position, in other words. He's teaching that you, have, you want to follow after righteousness. You want to pursue and be focused on the, the, the life of Christ, in essence. Philippians chapter 1, verse 11. <coughs> Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ under the glory and praise of God. Rochelle and I have the children on Wednesday night, and we're going to talk to them. What, is it, what does it mean to give glory to God? That's one way. That when you live by faith in what God has said and what God teaches and you take that doctrine and you have the life of Christ written down here and you take that, what goes in comes out. And when you renew your mind in, in, in God's truth, then you'll be transformed. That's what gives glory to God. It's the righteousness which is by Jesus Christ, not by the law. Okay? And see, Paul's telling Timothy, follow after that. Follow after that kind of, a, that kind of righteousness, that, that practical righteousness that we find in Christ. It's doing the right thing because of the right person. Come back with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Oh, man. 15, okay. I got five more to go through. So we got to hurry now. All right, godliness. 1 Timothy chapter 6. He says, follow after righteousness. It's not the teaching of the law. It's not teaching people that they, that they please God and that they're righteous because of the law, but rather it's found, find your righteousness in Christ. 
He died for you. He loved you. He gave, he gave you his life. This is life eternal, that they, that, they, that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. John 17, verse 3. That this is eternal life. Remember Paul talks about in Philippians, that I might know him. Knowing him, having eternal life. Whoops there. Having eternal life is knowing God. And knowing who he is. And being identified with that. 1 Timothy 6, verse 11. Follow after righteousness and godliness. Now, I want you to see something about this issue of godliness. Come with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Again, all I just want you to see are the contrast. Why does Paul bring up these six things? Because there were men in Ephesus that were teaching things they shouldn't, and they were struggling with all six of those issues. Where did they find their righteousness? Not in Christ, but in the law. Where did they find godliness? Look at here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse... 2 Timothy 3, verse 5, or starting in verse 1. This know also that in the, last day, in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. When your kids aren't listening to you, you know you're living in perilous times. I'm learning that. Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinence, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. Now he says, having a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. Come down, keep, keep reading down there in verse 7. We'll see what that power there is. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laid with sins, led away with divers lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the, the knowledge of the truth. Can you imagine that? Constantly learning. Do you ever talk to people that they're just engrossed in Scripture, but they don't really get it? I'm not, I'm not trying to be mean or, or knock them. The problem is they, they're, not, they're not consenting to the wholesome words of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is according to the doctrine, which is according to godliness. They're not, they're not taking Paul's, Paul's doctrine and, and learning that. They're ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. The truth there is, is God's word, according to Paul's ministry and message. Now, as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. You will have men that will resist the truth. When you preach and when you talk to your neighbors and your friends and your families, they will resist you. Not all of them, but some. They resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was. But, isn't that a great word? We like big butts and we cannot lie. I'm going to hear about that one later. But thou hast fully known what? My doctrine. I see you giggling over there. Thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, and charity, and patience. They had a form of godliness, but they denied the power thereof. What were they denying? They were denying the truth. They were denying the doctrine. And they had this form, they had this appearance of godliness. What is godliness? Godliness is taking God's life and living that on purpose. It's taking who God is and who, and who we are because of his life and living that with purpose. It's Christ's life. Righteousness is doing the right thing because of the right person. It's Christ. Godliness is taking his life and living that with purpose on purpose. That the choices I make is, that come from directly from God's word. It's not some sort of, you know, spontaneous... Uh, um, you know, I feel like you know, being a good person today. No, it's I, I, I have my mind in God's word. It's renewed. I'm being transformed. I'm believing and I'm trusting and I'm walking by faith. And it's God's life and it's his life that I'm taking and making choices based upon that. Amen. Okay. Oh, we'll, get, we'll work on that. This is good stuff. This is exciting stuff. They have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. From such, withdraw thyself, or from such, turn away, he says. Come with me to four, uh, 1 Timothy First Timothy chapter 6. We're going to have to cut out a lot. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3. I can't go through all the verses, but take, take some time some, some day to look at Godliness there in First and Second Timothy, and almost every single time it is it is attached to the doctrine. Every single time, I shouldn't say every single time, but most of the time. 
A lot of times people try to, they make it sound that doctrine is good, but you want to be, you know, but what about Christ and the Holy Spirit as if they're separate? Well, I want to live the Christian life, you know, knowing the doctrine's okay, and that's important too, but, you know, I want, I want to live right. You have to get this, this is so important. The doctrine, and you ever hear, I want to teach something more practical. Can you teach something more practical, please? I need something more practical. You're killing me with all this doctrine. Please just stop. <laughs> The doctrine is practical. You have to understand it. Otherwise, he wouldn't tell Titus in, 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 in uh, chapter 2 there, Titus 2, speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Then he gives you a big list of what? All kinds of practical things. The doctrine is practical. Now, I'm guilty of saying that, by the way, so I'm not picking on anyone. A little bit. 1 Timothy 6, verse 3, If any man teach otherwise, the things that Paul was, was talking to Timothy in the past five chapters there, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine. Notice that next phrase there, which is according to godliness. If you're not following the doctrine that was given to Paul, that message in that ministry, that's ungodly. And that's strong. I know that. And you tell most people that, and they would have a fit. That's why they would oppose you. But godliness comes from the doctrine. Don't ever be ashamed of that. Please. Faith. I got eight minutes. So two minutes apiece. Faith. First Timothy chapter one, verse nineteen. First Timothy one nineteen. He's talking about again, we'll start in verse eighteen. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before the, uh, on thee, that thou mightest war a good warfare. Eric's going to talk about the good fight of faith. It's a fight worth it, 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 it's something worth fighting for. And he says, I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. I mean, they didn't get off the boat. They ruined it. They crashed it. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. And it was like, that, like Ted was talking about uh, on Saturday. He gives them up to, to, to themselves. You want it? If any, if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. If you want to go this way, then you, you, you can't force them to, to do something that they don't want to do. And they're, and they're teaching things they shouldn't. And Paul says, I've delivered them unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. What did they do with faith? When he says, follow after faith, that's just constantly, continually trusting God's word. When people are teaching something that they shouldn't be teaching, what is our response? What does God say about the matter? What saith the scripture? And keep believing and trusting God's word according to the doctrine. And these men, he says, concerning faith, have made shipwreck. And Alexander and, 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 and Hymenaeus, they were both, we learned, that they were teaching all kinds of things, that the resurrection was past, and so on. Notice, come with me to 2 Timothy. Alexander is brought up there. 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. Paul writes here, 2 Timothy 4, 14, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord will reward him according to his works. But of whom be thou aware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. And I'm learning that the more you open your mouth and talk about these things, there will be people that will withstand and, 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 and your words and what you're preaching. And what's the answer to that? Keep following after the doctrine. Keep believing the doctrine. Keep trusting in that. There's all these characteristics that, that Paul talks about uh, to Timothy. The man of God is, he's faithful, right? He flees, he follows, he fights. He's faithful, he's trusting, he's committed. He protects, he guards. He takes heed. And you can, the list goes on and on and on and on. But what is, what is the, the, the foolish man, what is he known for? Having the form of godliness, but denies the power. Makes shipwreck, subverting the hearers. All kinds of things. You have to keep trusting, following after, believing and trusting in God's word. Faith is just taking God at his word. Righteousness, doing the right thing because of the right person. Godliness, living God's life on purpose. Faith, believing what God said. And the next one he brings up there in 1 Timothy 6 is love. We have to move quickly here. 1 Timothy, uh, actually, turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 
2 Timothy chapter 3, he says there in verse 2, or verse 1 there, This now know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Notice there in verse 4, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pre- pleasure more than lovers of God. See, actually, if you're there in 2 Timothy, look at chapter 4, verse 10. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. What are they doing? They're loving themselves. They're loving the world. They're loving the the pleasures of the world. Can you imagine that? Look at that in in verse 10. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. What does Galatians 1.4 describe the world as? Evil. Christ delivered us from this present evil world, and there's a man reverting back to that. And we scratch our heads and say, how can someone do that? I don't understand. How can they do that? And we're going to look at that. It is hard to believe. And we say to ourselves all the time, I'm sure, I could never do that. See, the fact, the fact is, you might want to watch that, though. Because, again, we, we learned, Paul here is warning Timothy that you can, and so can we. 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, since you're there. Verse 7 For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That spirit, the, the, your inner man character. God hasn't given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And what do we learn about God's love? And what do we learn about the love of Christ? It constrains us. It, it gets a grip on us and it motivates us. And that's the motivating factor is why we serve him. He says in Galatians chapter 5, I believe, by love serve one another, verse 13. Love is the motivation, understanding that God, when he, he, he commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. And, it's, and that's where it all starts. We love him because he first loved us, 1 John 4, 19 says. And we have a, love is God's price tag. Why would I love you? And why would I love a lost man? Why would you love me? Why would you, why would you look at that person and say, you know what, I want to serve him? Why would you do any of that? Because when you look at the price tag, you know what it says? One way or another, it says, it's Christ shed blood. He died for you, and he died for me, and he died for that lost man out there. That's why I love him, because Christ loved me, and it starts there, and and it's, we, we, you know, well, I I, I can get too carried away, but but understand that, please, that when you follow after that that love, it's pursuing the, the love of Christ that constrains us. Patience. He says, follow after patience. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. I want you to notice here what, what patience is and, and what it's produced to do. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 4. 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 4. And the Thessalonians were going through all kinds of uh, uh, persecution and tribulation and so on. Uh, Notice what he says there in verse 4, So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye, what? Endure. Patience is the ability to endure the affliction and the tribulation with a goal in mind. That's what that is. Remember, tribulation works patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. And patience is the ability to get through a time of difficulty looking at that goal. Now that goal, come with me to, oh boy, um, come with me to 2, Thessalonians, or 2 Timothy, rather, chapter 4. Patience. Why would, why would Timothy need patience? Patience. Look at what he's going through. 1 Timothy, he says, some have turned away, teaching things they shouldn't be teaching. By the time you get to 2, uh, 2 Timothy, he says, all of they which are in Asia have, have, have uh, turned away from me. 2 Timothy chapter 4, notice what he says there in verse... Mm, I've got to find the verse. Verse 7, verse 6. For I am now ready, here's Paul talking, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is ha- at hand. I have fought a good fight... I have finished my course. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. 
So the, the patience, learning and, and, and how to endure, because we have, we have God's word here. And that's what gets us through the trouble and the, and the tribulation and the difficulty. But having that, that patience enables us to endure the false teaching and the opposition and the adversity so that we can finish our course with joy. And that we can fight the good fight. So the patience helps there so that we can finish our course. It's endurance. The last one, I know you're probably hungry. And if you hear me growling at you, it's just my stomach. First, come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And we'll start wrapping up. Notice, notice what meekness is here. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 21, or verse 19. But I will come to you shortly, if the Lord will, and will know, not, not the speech of them which are puffed up, but, of, but the power. Verse 20, for the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What will ye? Shall I come unto you with a rod, or in love, and in the spirit of meekness? Paul has authority as, as, as the apostle of the Gentiles. He has authority. Corinthians were doing things they shouldn't have been doing. And he says, I'm going to come to you, but should I use a rod? Should I exercise my authority? Or in love and in the spirit of meekness? Meekness is having a, having a lowliness of mind, having the right perspective of who you are, not to think more highly than you, than, than you, uh, you ought to think, and being able to, it's, it's like reserve power. You know, they say meekness isn't weakness, right? And it might come off that way. What about Moses? He was known as the, the meekest man on all the earth. And he had power, just like Paul. He had, he had authority directly from God, and he could have used it, and he could have, he could have abused it, what have you. But instead of that, he used lowliness. Christ says, I am meek and lowly in heart. Here's Christ, God Almighty, on earth, and can exercise all kinds of authority, but he doesn't for the benefit of others. And meekness is being able to, is being able to have, have a power on your... We have power on our side, by the way, don't we? When you know the doctrine and you know the truth and you have God's word, that's a, that's a lot. And we can abuse that. And sometimes we make the mistake of doing that. But meekness is the ability to, to not abuse that and to, to hold back, to re, have reserve power and to use that for the benefit of another. 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Why would Timothy need meekness? 2 Timothy 2 verse 24. Notice verse 23, 2 Timothy 2, 23, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid. Questions aren't the problem. Okay, don't ever read this verse and think that if you ask questions, that's a problem because God says don't ask questions. He didn't say that. He said don't ask stupid questions. <laughs> Knowing that they do gender strives. Verse 24, and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. There's that patience there. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they, that, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. And you could see why Timothy would need meekness, because he was, he was charged to, to, to teach others that they, that they teach no other doctrine. And he was to, he was to challenge those, those men to hold the truth and hold fast to the truth. And he was to do it in a spirit of meekness. Not thinking more highly. He was an apostle. Not to think more highly of himself. You know, he doesn't just say, hey, listen, you know who I am? I'm a big deal. I'm kind of a big deal, man. He doesn't do that. But rather, he uses God's word to instruct them. And we know 2 Timothy 3, 7, 16, we have instruction in righteousness. And that meekness is, is being able to take the, the power that we have and hold that back for the benefit of another. Now, righteousness, it's Christ's righteousness. Godliness, it's Christ's life. Faith, it's the faith of Christ. Love, it's the love of Christ. Patience, it's the ability to endure because you have Christ's life, you have his word, and that's what's going to get you through the, the, the trouble. Meekness, Christ says that he was meek and lowly in, in, in heart. All these things that he describes here is Jesus Christ. Any good thing. It's the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. And when, again, this is the Lord Jesus Christ written down on paper. 
And we take that and we take that life and we, and we put it in our thinking, not just knowing it, but believing it, trusting it and saying, God, what you said is right. And then do so accordingly. Come with me to Philippians chapter 3. And we're going to end here. Now, we should always be careful when we use certain tools and so on for you know, Greek words and, and so on. Um, you have the completed word of God. It's perfect. It's inerrant. It's preserved here in the King James Bible. But I want you to, you can look this up for yourself. I, and I, and I, I thought this was interesting. I looked up that word following after. And it's trans, you have that word translated follow after. It's also translated persecution or persecuted. Now, you do the homework. Don't take my word for it. Check it out. And you can get that information from the verses anyhow. But I bring that up for this purpose and this purpose only. It's very interesting. When you read in Acts 26, verse 11, where Paul says, I persecuted the church even unto strange cities. How do you persecute someone to strange cities? What was Paul doing? He was chasing after those saints, wasn't he? He was following after them. That's the idea there. He was chasing after them. I want to leave you with this illustration. Again, don't take my word for it. Check that out if, you, if you'd like. You get it from the verses anyhow, but I bring that to your attention. Philippians chapter 3. And notice here in verse, we'll start in verse 4. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, there's that word, persecuting the church. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me. Now think of this for a minute. Remember what the following after is. It's that zealous, focused, heated pursuit. It's an ongoing, perpetual following. It's ever following. It's to be our very heart's desire. Paul says, concerning zeal, I persecuted the church. I was chasing after the saints. I was hunting them down. I was trying to get rid of them. And notice that verse after that where he says in verse 7, those things were gain to me. What happened in 1 Timothy chapter 6? That they were saying, gain is godliness. The men that were departing from the faith, what did they say? Gain is godliness. They were replacing righteousness, godliness, faith, patience, meekness. Uh, did I name all, name them all? Godliness, patience, righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Okay. All those things, all of those things, they replaced with a form, a form of godliness, but they denied the power thereof. They had their own righteousness. They had a form of godliness. They had their own faith. They had their own love. They were lovers of themselves, lovers of the world, lovers of the pleasures of the world. They, you know, he says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, all that is in the world is not of the Father, but is of the world. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, and that's all that the world has to offer. And they, and they, they took that, and they wanted that. And we say, how does someone fall into that? There's people we know. Dear brothers, that we know. And they fell into those things. And you say, how does someone get there? I can't imagine how they would do that. The answer is, and we'll see here in Philippians 3, and this is kind of a basic answer, a simple answer, but it's, it's true nonetheless. Those things were gained to me. Those I counted lost for who? For Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Come down there to verse, verse uh, 12. Not as though I already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after. The same word there is persecution. I follow after. I was once following after and pursuing this, this unrighteousness and this sin, but now I'm following after someone else. I'm following after Christ. I follow after that, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark. Same word as that following after. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. 
That's who I'm following after. I, it's no longer the persecution. It's no longer following the wrong thing. Those men in 1 Timothy 6 were following after what? Their own righteousness. They, were, they, were, they had a desire, a heart's desire to pursue what? Their own righteousness, their own godliness, their own faith, love, patience, meekness. They replaced the most important person in their life and the most important person in, in your life and in my life, the Lord Jesus Christ. They replaced him. Oh, sorry. Is it getting too loud? Oh, sorry. Well, don't stand by the, the speakers. They replaced him. There we Okay. Oh, time, time. Okay. They replaced him. I'm sorry. They replaced Christ. With all those other things. I asked you earlier, why are you here? Why do you believe what you believe? Why do you suffer the, the awkward you know, occurrences in the grocery store when you meet your, you know, your neighbor who's down at the Baptist church and says, hey, what you up to? How's church? You know, well, there's five of us. We're doing well. Why would you go through that? Because there's someone here that's more precious and more valuable to us than anything else. And when men deviate from that and they turn away and they replace Christ and all that he is with their own love, the love of the world and the love of themselves and so on and so forth, that's how they get in trouble. The reason, the way we stay on track is to always focus on the mark, always focus on Lord Jesus Christ. And we follow after that. We don't look this way, we don't look that way, we focus on him. And you do that, that's how you follow after it is a heated, focused pursuit, ongoing, after who Lord Jesus Christ is. It's his life and it's his doctrine. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for, for who you are, for all that you are. Your life and the fact that we have that, that you gave that to us as a free gift. And Lord, we can't thank you enough for that. I pray for every one of us here. that we continually, always, look, look to you, press toward the mark, to know you and to, and to possess you. We, we want to we have what, what you want with us. We want to have the life that you've given us, and we want to follow after that, Lord. And we thank you for giving, giving that to us as a free gift because of your faithfulness and because of your love. And, Lord, I, I pray we just always focus on that. And we thank you for the fellowship this week.